So I just woke up from being passed out for like four straight fucking hours because me and Scarlett have been in con crunch for two days now. We decided to cosplay video game characters, not remembering the fact that video game characters pretty exclusively have pretty complicated designs. But anyway, the simple process of like hand sewing some stuff together has made me realize that a very important piece of comic book history is probably completely bullshit. I call bullshit on you, Peter Parker. I call bullshit that you made that fucking suit. I call even more bullshit on you, Miles Morales, that you made your first suit. For those of you who didn't know, Spider-Man was originally said to just have sewn his suit. This one panel is the explanation of how he gets his fucking costume. And since then, it's been pretty common that Peter Parker sews his suit back together when he gets damaged. At least when he has a cloth suit, it's usually stated that he made the cloth suit. This motherfucker apparently pieced together a functioning and good superhero suit out of secondhand wrestling singlets, which and then was apparently able to sew that together with such clean accuracy that other regular superheroes were just like, yep, he's one of us now. Absolutely not. Bullshit. Bullshit on you, sir. You're sewing that shit by hand. That is a needle and thread. You don't even have a sewing machine. That shit's not fucking happening. And Miles Morales' original suit was stated to be a repurposed Halloween costume. I'm sorry, have you seen Spider-Man Halloween costumes? Motherfuckers jumping around the city trying to stop crime in this shit. Have you ever worn one of these? If you lift your arm too high above your head, you feel like the entire back of your suit is just gonna rip in half. And don't even get me started on seeing out of the eyes. That's just not happening. Is it obvious I am very tired and I'm excited to be done with these fucking suits? What other superheroes do you think absolutely did not make their own costume? Let me know in the comments. I spent the whole afternoon at Emerald City Comic Con dressed as a Court of the Owls member and didn't get recognized once. Clark Kent ain't got shit on me. Y'all thought that I would live with a mohawk since fucking kindergarten and then go as Kratos? Hell no, man. We're God King Atreus, baby. The axe is a family heirloom. We don't need to say that it is just Kratos. This can be Atreus's too. I very much believe that this suit fits the goddamn hype that I've given it. Out here rocking the boy fit. All right, I've made my contractually obligated content for the day. I'm gonna go back to the Comic Con again. Hey, you, stranger, get out of here. I want to lean there. Asshole. <laughs> So watching the trailer for the new TMNT movie coming out, uh, I had a bit of a thought. Now, it's been said by pretty much everybody that all of the Robins have pretty close approximants in all of the Turtles. At least I've heard that comparison before a couple of times. It's not 100% correct. Leo is usually characterized as a bit more lawful good. The Nightwing is, I mean, Damien and Michelangelo don't match up almost at all. I guess if you swapped out Damien for Stephanie, then you have a pretty good Mike equivalent. That's not the point, not the point of the video. This is more of a call to writers of, of Robin's story. Usually stories focus on like one or two Robins at maximum. You have a Nightwing book, Tim Drake shows up a bunch, there you go. You have a couple of Robins, that's two. You have a Tim Drake book, Jason Todd shows up a lot, there you go, that's two. You have a Jason Todd book, you give them two characters that never had anything to do with Jason Todd and push them off into a corner. That's how you make a Jason Todd. My references are 52 in both iterations of the Outlaws, fight me. But my question to writers is, why, why don't you just make them the fucking turtles, man? Like you have a perfect blueprint for how to make a Robin story in basically every iteration of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Like I said, it's not perfect, but that's how you make four equally compelling characters work in a single narrative, especially while maintaining a brotherly dynamic and the youthful dynamic. Just write them like they're the turtles. You have four multicolor characters who all operate out of a single city in the shadows, mostly at nighttime, each with their own individual weapon, personality, they fight an assorted group of baddies that all pretty much have personal ties to the father figure that they have in some way, shape, or form. And if they don't, then they're an independently intelligent and or resourceful person who ended up stumbling into a situation where they are able to fight these four brothers at any given time. You have additions to the cast that have connections to one or all of the brothers that can actually become part of the dynamic, or characters that have a much stronger code of ethics that are in a completely different set of stories that make brief interjectures into the story of the four brothers. Like honestly, writing 
a Robin show would be the easiest fucking thing in the world because you just write the TMNT. That could even work for a Robin's comic. I know that the Robin's comic didn't fucking do very well, but maybe if they wrote it like the Turtles, it might have. Like, obviously, the personalities are going to be different. The stories are going to be different. The circumstances are going to be different. But, like, as a baseline, I think it's pretty fucking solid. And, yes, watching Rise and realizing that that Leo was a lot more like Nightwing really did cue me into this. Those videos will be coming back eventually, I promise. But let me know your guys' opinion. Do you guys think that a TMNT-style Robin's show slash comic would work really well? Do you think that this comparison holds water? Either way, I want to know your opinion. So either stitch this video or comment. I don't care. And with that, Emerald City Comic Con is over. Yes, I hyped that cosplay up for that long and then gave y'all one fucking video with it. Sue me. Y'all have no idea how many sleepless nights it took to get that fucker on. I wanted to sleep instead of make videos. But God King Atreus do be looking pretty good though. As did Scarlet who went through Thor's daughter and fucking killed it. Look at us out here looking all cool and badass as hell. Alright, enough ranting. Let's get back to work. Welcome back to Regrettable Superhero of the Week, the weekly not weekly show where I pick one character at random out of the League of Regrettable Superheroes and then I run him the fuck down. Let's see a we are getting today. I am begging you to give someone just at, at least a little entertain. The straw man? The straw man? This motherfucker's just gonna be a scarecrow, isn't he? Jeez, this dude's like last couple of pages. This guys must be modern as hell. Shit, I missed a page. Hold on. So correct me if I'm wrong, but this feels like copyright infringement. Bro, is your fucking tagline hee 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 hee? Absolutely nothing about anything about this cover tells me that you are a superhero. Is he a man or a demon born in the darkest pits of hell? Death Quest. <laughs> Scarecrow got sick and tired of getting the shit kicked out of him by Batman, so he stole his fucking entrance and then jumped to Marvel. I swear to God, if this motherfucker's name is Jonathan, I'm gonna lose my fucking mind. Not regrettable. This character is badass as hell. The Straw Man, originally known as the Scarecrow, was created by Scott Edelman and Rico Rival in Dead of Night number 11 of Marvel Comics of August of 1975. The Straw Man is not a superhero. She is a fucking cryptid. The Straw Man occupies a other dimensional world accessible only through a haunted painting. When the painting falls into trouble, or the people who own it fall into trouble, thus threatening the painting, the Straw Man will go into the physical physical world. And I quote, the straw man's keening laughter would be heard and the shambling grinning figure would appear. His laughter is described as strangled and soul rending. And he has the magical power to control birds, direct the weather, grow new bodies, and just a whole bunch more freaky shit. And apparently the straw man isn't even his true form, only a grain stock shell which inhabits whatever is on the other side of that haunted painting. This Marvel superhero is a literal demon from another dimension that only exists to protect itself and the thing that inhabits it. That's fucking metal. Where is this guy's movie? I want him in the MCU yesterday. I literally have no idea why they don't use him more other than the fact that his original name is a little legally touchy. But this dude is awesome and I want a horror movie with him yesterday. Make it happen, Marvel. So recently, me and Scarlett started watching a second show because we can't stay dedicated to a single show for any given amount of time. That show being Young Justice because I really liked the show and Scarlett had never seen it even though she's a huge DC fan. For reference, see previous comments about not being able to stick with a show for any dedicated amount of time. So we're slowly making our our way through the show and we're watching season one right now and the forever people episode showed up which i like to call the therapy episode because it's also the episode that everybody clips to hell because there's a bunch of therapy sessions for all the characters going on but i don't want to talk about that i mean talking about superheroes mental health is like 40 percent of my page so whatever no what i want to talk about is the other half of that episode which is the appearance of the forever people for those of you who don't know the forever people are these guys they're a group of five superheroes that originate from New Genesis, so they're a Jack Kirby creation. And they become fairly reoccurring characters in Young Justice. And for the life of me, whenever I would watch the therapy episode, I would always think that it's my favorite episode, minus the half where the random people from nowhere pop up and Superboy goes on a tiny adventure. Because that's not what I came here for. I want to listen to the fucking superhero therapy. That's the cool part. And I expressed this to Scarlet when we were watching it. I was like, ah, yes, this is my favorite episode of the show, other than, you know, this half where these random nobodies show up. And Scarlet, out of nowhere, leans over to me and says, Honey, it's because they're Power Rangers. Now I want it known. I'm a Power Rangers fan. 
I love the Power Rangers. Somewhere out there, there's a picture of Baby Panda in a red Phoenix Ranger outfit from Power Rangers Mystic Force from one of my first costumes in Halloween ever. I mean, for fuck's sake, this is in my studio. I like Power Rangers. And I don't know how I never saw it before. There are five members of the team. They're each in different colors. There's only like one girl. All of their personalities are so overblown that they're basically stereotypes. There is the leader, the girl, the one that likes to fight, the southern one, the one that barely talks and therefore the audience kind of forgets about them. They have a little mechanical box thing that's sentient and talks to them and allows them to transform. Their ship is technically sentient. I mean, for fuck's sake, they all combine into one and make a fucking Megazord. And I just sat there in bafflement for minutes on end because how the hell did I not notice that? Now, I stressed how much I like Power Rangers because I wanted to make it clear. The reason I did not like that part of the episode is not because I do not like Power Rangers. The reason that that half of the episode throws me off is because the tone of Power Rangers and the tone of superheroes who are now traumatized and need to go to therapy they they don't usually cross over that much so the tonal whiplash was throwing me off but all of this was just an excuse for me to say there are power rangers in young justice You've reached NokoCon. How can I help? Hey, NokoCon. This is uh, this is Panda Red. How you been? Hello. Hold, please. You sound really familiar. Have Have we met? Uh. Yeah, I assume it would. I was a guest at your show last year. I had a line at my table almost out the door. You sure you don't remember me? So, Mr. The Red, can I can I call you Panda? Did you just call me Mr. The Red? Okay, yeah, whatever. I I just had a really good time at your guys' show last year. I uh, wanted to know if you guys would want me back this year. Oh, yeah, right, 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 right. You hold on just one more second, please. Seriously? Uh, uh, okay, sure, I guess. Okay, guys, listen. We're going to get Panda Red back. Play cool. Oh my god, it's Panda Red! Slow down a minute. Uh, you know, we we liked having you, but we might need something a little different. Can you do, like, any magic tricks? Maybe a little bit of juggling? You know, we can't do the same show. Magic trick? Dude, are you feeling okay? I mean, I seem like the crowd really liked what we did last year. I mean, I felt like last year went really well. Mr. The Red. Still just Panda. Panda. If we're going to do this, we need to come up with something new, something fresh. So, I mean, I can't accept anything less than, you know, two shows on the main stage and a panel and right. maybe eating a really gross sandwich or good sandwich, depending on how the dice roll goes. Okay, yes, fine. That all sounds fine. Good, great. That sounds amazing. Wait, what did you just say about a sandwich? And you are booked. The flight is non-refundable, so please don't try to back out of this. Uh, we got the hotel already booked for you. You're good to go. Panda, you are the best. Thanks for coming. Click. Oh, my God, guys, we got Panda Red. What the hell just happened? So I'm sure that we've all heard, I know I have, the idea that Superman should talk with a more southern accent. The logic goes, the boy's from Kansas, he's obviously going to have some sort of native accent. And because of that, he should use that to put people at ease and also to distinguish himself from Clark Kent. But I disagree, I think there's a better way to do this. Yes, Clark Kent would most likely have a more southern to middle American accent. He is a born and raised Kansas farm boy, he went to rural school, Smallville is called Smallville. The man's just gonna have a little bit of a southern accent because he's been he's been born and raised in the American South his entire goddamn life. That's just how the cards play out. But here's the thing. I don't think Superman should have the accent. Clark Kent should be the country bumpkin. He's smart. He's a very smart man and he wants people to know he's smart but he also wants people to know that he is a fucking klutz. Clark Kent to Superman as an identity is a big clumsy himbo who walks around and ends up being a really fucking good reporter. Superman, truth, justice, in the American way Superman, cannot be from any one specific location. By bursting into a newly saved airplane and being like, well, 
I hope everybody's okay. I hope everybody isn't too injured. I just want everybody to know, despite of the current circumstances, air travel is still the safest way to travel. Now, will you please escort yourself to the front of this aeroplane? We'll reveal the fact that his family is somewhere in the American South, as well as not putting some people at ease. Big Southern white boys aren't exactly everybody's idea of comfortable. But also, that makes Superman representative of one specific spot. The man sounds like he's from the American South. It's known that he's from America, but no specific spot in this giant fucking country. The only thing that anybody knows is that Superman patrols Metropolis, which is on the East Coast. Nothing else is known. And by that, Superman can be a representative of the entire country of America. When he wants to be, Superman has renounced his American citizenship a couple of times. And because of that, he can set more people at ease by not having a specific accent. No, 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 no. My solution is that Superman should have what British people call his American standard accent. You can hear it anytime a British person puts on an American accent. It sounds American. But something's a little off. And it's because it doesn't sound like it's from anywhere. There's no specific dialect. There's no specific accent of the region. It's not a Northwestern accent where they can't pronounce their T's and everything comes out sounding like D's. Waiter, water, you get the point. Doesn't sound Southern. Doesn't sound like an Eastern accent. Doesn't sound Middle America. It, it just sounds American. Superman should have an American standard accent and Clark Kent should have a Southern accent. Or at the very least, a Middle American accent. That's the way we distinguish the two and that's the way that we make them nowhere near each other. And that's the way his friends know who's talking when they're talking to him. Am I talking to Superman or Clark Kent? I don't know. That's my opinion. Yeah, because he's been he's been born and raised in the American South his entire goddamn life. That's just how the cards play out. Okay, so Kansas isn't in the South. In my defense, I have lived on the West Coast my entire life. Anything that is not on a coast is a nebulous soup of states. Rural farmland automatically makes my brain assume South. And I don't know why I didn't look at a fucking map before making a video about regional fucking accents, but I, I'm sorry. Superman would not have a Southern accent because Kansas is like dead center of America. He would have the most Midwestern accent you've ever fucking heard. However, I will say that my point still fucking stands. I think, I hope, I saw that that video got a lot of stitches, but I could tell that all of them were telling me that I was wrong, so I haven't actually watched all of them, and I know that a good portion of them are people with Kansas accents talking so that I can hear what it sounds like. So I'm gonna take a second and I'm gonna look up a video of someone from Kansas talking so that I can hear what the actual accent sounds like so that I can say if the difference between Superman and Clark Kent would even be fucking distinguishable. They would sound the exact fucking same. God. Damn it, I thought I was on to something. Apparently roughly 95% of Kansas has a general American accent already. Like there is some very, very minor things. Like pull and pool sound almost the same. Pin and pen sound almost the same. But nothing that anyone would be able to pick up on. However, I think it would be even funnier if that means that Clark Kent exaggerates. Because I know for damn sure that I was not the only one that thought that Kansas sounded fucking Southern. So what if he fucking made it so that people thought Clark Kent sounded Southern? Play off of this general thought that apparently Kansas is in the South and start talking with a Southern accent, but make it very subtle so that only a couple people pick up on it. That way he can distinguish the way that he talks in sort of a country bumpkin-esque, like somewhat Southern accent and say, oh yeah, I grew up on a farm down in Kansas somewhere. To distinguish Clark Kent from Superman, where he drops his voice and then starts to talk in a much more Central American accent. You know how we talk about how every superhero has three identities? Batman has Brucey Wayne, which is what he shows the public. Batman which is what he shows criminals, and then Bruce Wayne, the person that Alfred and all the Robins know. Superman has the same thing. He's got Clark Kent, who he shows the Daily Planet, who is the big country bumpkin. We have Superman, which he shows the public, which is the infallible hero of the world. And then there is Clark, the person that he shows his friends. Clark probably speaks with his regular accent. Clark Kent probably has a slightly southern accent to play off of people's preconceived notions. And then Superman has the type of speech that everyone would assume he would have. I think that's a good way to fix this without entirely saying that I was just wrong. Which I was. I was wrong. Apologies to the state of Kansas. So I had somebody in a, uh, in a stream recently point out the fact that I have been consistently making videos for nearly 
for nearly three for nearly three years. Currently, this is my longest active employment that I have ever had. I posted my first video in February of 2020, and I'm currently having an existential crisis on how long I've been doing this. Not a bad thing. Not a bad thing at all. Just weird, weird to fucking think about. So with that little existential tangent out of the way, uh, welcome back to my longest running series, debatably, uh, Regrettable Superhero of the Week, where I pick one character at random out of the League of Regrettable Superheroes and then I run them the fuck down. Who are we getting today? Please be regrettable this time. Last time was like really fucking good. Don't you make me do ROM. Don't you make me do ROM! Sir Superhero just did a video on this guy! This is ROM. ROM is a space knight, and I'm gonna save us all a little bit of fucking trouble. Approved. Rom is not, nor has he ever been, regrettable. I have no clue why he is on this list at all. This is like one of 12 different looks he's had. Just look at how fucking metal this cover is. Rom is laying down a fucking slaughter to save this dude who's getting fucking crucified. That is insanely cool. Is he melting this guy? Rom the Toy was created by Bing McCoy, and the comic was created by Bill Mantlo and Sal Buscema in Rom number one of Marvel Comics of December of 1979. So Rom the Toy was originally introduced as a competitor to the Star Wars toy line that Kenner produced. Remember, this is in 1979. Star Wars is still a very big and modern thing. I know, I know, completely unrelatable to modern times, but stick with me a little bit, okay? Rom Toy, fuck. Fucking bombed. Really bad sales, nobody really liked it, that's not the point. The comic series that Marvel released in conjunction with it though, fucking took off. And that's because the story that was essentially created completely for the comic, fucking slapped. I'm gonna read this straight from the fucking book. A cyborg space knight of the planet Glador, Rom has spent two centuries in an interplanetary conflict with the Dire Race, a race of shape-shifting alien sorcerers. His crusade takes him to Earth, where he discovers that the Dire Wraiths have adopted human form and integrated themselves into society, poised to destroy it from within. Rom's got some weaponry to fight him, though. The analyzer that can detect dire wraiths no matter what form they're in and the neutralizer which condemns dire wraiths to and i quote a shadow zone he sends them to the shadow realm and it leaves behind what looks like burnt human remains rom is metal as fuck if you want more info on him just go watch your superheroes video he's awesome approve Okay, so I am going to make a pretty big assumption here and say that we all know what legacy characters are. For those of you who don't, that's when a character is created that shares the same name as a, another character and therefore inherits their legacy. Best example I can think of is The Flash. Jay Garrick was The Flash in the Golden Age, and then Barry Allen was The Flash in the Silver Age, and then Wally West adopted it from him, and then Bart Allen adopted it from him, and then... Barry Allen came back and fucked up the whole naming convention. Or, in keeping with my usual theming, Robin. Dick Grayson was Robin, and then Jason Todd was Robin, and then Tim Drake was Robin, and then Stephanie Brown was Robin, and then Damian Wayne was Robin, and, and so on and so forth. But you see, I have a question about the universe that those legacy characters inhabit. That being... Do you think that the average citizen knows that those are legacy characters? Like, yes, a lot of the times they'll do jokes in, in movies and shows and stuff where, like, the goons know that that's a different Robin. But let's let's just ignore that factor, right? Realistically, do you think that somebody on the ground would know that a character has transitioned into a different person? What's to say that that character's not just rocking a new costume today? Like, honestly, characters switch their costumes all the time, they switch up their tactics, they switch up who they're fighting, how they're fighting them, like... What's to say that the old Flash didn't just get a shinier costume with white eyes and start joking a little bit more? <laughs> Heroes don't really use their civilian names. They're all built like fucking Adonises. There's not really a way to tell it's a different guy. Unless you're like a super villain and have heard them speak like a whole bunch of times. So are we relying on the fact that most characters know that it's a different superhero because a bigger supervillain told him, ah, no, that's not the same guy. I've gotten kicked by Robin. That guy kicked way harder. And I mean, that's obviously neglecting the facts where it's like super obvious. Like Clark Kent and John Kent Superboy are very obviously not the same fucking guy. But I'm genuinely curious if other characters in the universe would know that a character has turned into a legacy character. I don't know. Let me know your opinions. I want to hear them. I think it's probably no, but I want to hear what you guys have to say. All right, I'm literally filming this while I am on the waiting screen for my own stream. So I, I, this is an important topic. This is a very, very complicated question because I would argue 
yes and no. Yes in the fact that there are multiple people throughout history that take on the name of Spider-Man and just Spider-Man. No Spider-Man red, Spider-Man blue, just Spider-Man. However, he, here is the thing. A good portion of these Spider-Men are operating at the exact same time. So they're not a legacy character in the classic sense, they're more of a legacy character in the more modern sense, where there are characters like The Flash, who exist in both Barry Allen and Wally West. Originally, legacy characters were titles that were passed down, hence legacy. The Flash was Barry Allen, and then it was Wally West, and then it was Bart Allen. Usually they weren't all operating as The Flash at the exact same time. But with Spider-Man, there is Scarlet Spider, there is Scarlet Spider, there is Spider-Man, there is Spider-Man, there is Spider-Woman, there is Spider-Woman. I'm starting to realize they kind of run in twos, don't they? Jeff Peter Parker and Miles Morales, who are both Spider-Man. You have Ben Riley and Kane Parker, who are both Spider-Man. No, I am not acknowledging that Chasm exists. You have Jessica Drew and the, the other Spider-Woman, whose name I can't remember right now. <laughs> and all of them operate at the exact same time. The only one who I would really count as a classical definition legacy character is Spider-Man 2099. Because newsflash, he's just Spider-Man. They don't call him Spider-Man 2099 in his own book. All of this is a very roundabout way of saying kinda. I think of Spider-Man as a character who becomes a legacy character, like Miles Morales' original origin makes him a legacy character. And actively, since there are multiple people running around calling themselves Spider-Man, yet he's technically a legacy character. But I feel like there's a lot more thought that goes into that than just yes or no. But if you want a concrete answer, then I'll just say, classical definition, no, I wouldn't really count him as a legacy character. But modern definition, yeah, he's basically a legacy character. So a while back, I told you guys that I was logging all of the graphic novels that I own. Well, I've been working on that a little bit here and there in the background, and I finally got all of my Marvel comics. And as I'm logging them, I actually started to notice a bit of a pattern, a bit of a difference between DC and Marvel. That being that Marvel has a higher likelihood to make a story about their entire universe than DC does. Now, don't get me wrong, DC's really, like, well-known for, like, their crises, right? Crises? Crises? Whatever, that, the, the, the crisis that they do. This universe-shattering event that happens every so often. But more often than not, their books are either focused on a single character or a single team, outside of the aforementioned crises. A book isn't a DC Universe book, it's a Justice League book. It's a Teen Titans book, it's an Outsiders book. You get the point. Marvel has a higher tendency to make an entire comic about... What if the whole world was different? Marvel's Earth X, Age of Apocalypse, The Ultimates, fucking Marvel 1602, all of the various kills the Marvel Universes books. I just think it's interesting that Marvel has a higher tendency to make a story about what if the whole world was different, how would that affect everyone, while DC's books are usually what if the whole world was different, told through the perspective of one individual person. Or team, if the book calls for it. I don't know, just thought I would share that little, that little discovery that I made. Man, I am just trying to clean the house and, and get ready for the fact it's Scarlett's birthday today. I'm trying to take the day fucking easy, man. And this goddamn TikTok trial shit, I'm doing my best to ignore it. If this app gets banned, I have a link tree. It's got a bunch of other socials. I've been prepping YouTube content for like months now, so it's gonna be up there soon. If this gets taken down, I have like a 60,000 subscriber YouTube you can go check out. I stream on the Purple app Tuesdays through Thursdays, so go, go check me out over there. If this ends up being nothing, great. This is just free advertisement. However, if it doesn't, because this kind of seems like it might be a little bit serious, um, go, go check me out because I would like to still have a job. We will adapt, we will overcome. Fuck everybody if this gets fucking banned. But hey, even if it does, you know where to find me. Love you guys, hope this app isn't contraband by the end of the day. For those of you who are not aware, uh, yesterday was Scarlett's birthday, and um, because of that, I'm tired as fuck. We stayed out way too late and stayed up way too late, so I, I'm not running on much sleep here. One of the benefits of being Scarlett's birthday yesterday, though, is I can finally free up my camera movements a little bit. Wait, hold on a minute. There we go, that's better. And that would be because her present has been on that table for like days, maybe weeks at this point. 
and my videos do come across her page, so I needed to stay at this angle so y'all couldn't fucking see it for so long. Thank God I can actually move the fucking camera now. Anyway, like I said, I'm tired and I don't want to think of a goddamn video to make, so welcome back to Regrettable Superhero of the Week, the weekly not weekly show where I pick one character at random out of the League of Regrettable Superheroes and then I run them the fuck down. Let's get someone who doesn't need a lot of explanation. Come on. Come on. Cat. Captain Sup, Captain Truth? Captain Truth! I'm gonna be perfectly honest, that sounds like the most boring character to ever exist. I was very wrong. Where is your shirt? Why are your ears so pointy? Are you an elf? Is this dude trying to shiv Uncle Sam? You remembered the gloves, the boots, the hat, and the cape, but you forgot the pants? I say this again, where is your shirt, Yankee Doodle Dandy? I... This character is actually surprisingly sad once I read it. Captain Truth, aka Ken Elliott, was created by Bob Fujitani in Gold Medal Comics number one of Cambridge House in 1945. Uh, the best explanation of the costume is that the homeboy's homeless. His superpowers are also not explained, those superpowers being flight and tremendous strength. But yeah, dude was evicted from his tenement and is just homeless. The city he patrols is described as filled with ramshackle homes, broken-hearted children, hungry families, and poverty. Shit, one of the stories is about him helping a young kid whose father is a criminal only because that's the only way he can feed his starving family. Out of all of the characters that have appeared on this fucking show, why is this one the super socially conscious one? This character appeared once in 1945, and a significant portion of his one and only story is apparently Apparently dedicated to him trying to rouse people up and tell them that everybody needs to stick together, even crooks, even ex-crooks, because that's the only way that we're going to win. This character has received a single reprint of his only adventure once. I'm gonna be real, this sounds dope as shit. Maybe find a way to explain whatever the hell's going on here. But like, I genuinely think that this character could be really fucking cool. An unhoused social outcast that tries to protect people and relies on the fact that communities need to hold each other up? That focuses on highlighting social issues of the day? Fuck yeah! Sign me up! This character sounds awesome! I actually cannot believe I'm saying this, but yeah. Panda seal of approval. This guy's cool. Okay, so I knew that something was up when I did the uh, Captain Truth video a couple of days ago. Like, things seemed a little bit too familiar, I thought the costume looked a little familiar. And that would be because apparently I already fucking did him, but it was like a year ago. And it was before I started putting stickers on the characters that I had done or not. So congratulations, y'all are getting a redo. Hopefully we don't get another fucking rerun, because that's the entire reason that I made the wheel, so that we wouldn't fucking get that anymore. Yeah. Let's get into it. Welcome back to Regrettable Superhero of the Week, the weekly not weekly show where I pick one character at random out of the League of Regrettable Superheroes and then I run him the fuck down. Let's see, we are getting to day. I am begging you, begging you to not give me a rerun. Who is th Star Stardust the Super Wizard? What the fuck do you have to do to be labeled as a super wizard? Apparently the answer to that question is just to be thick as fuck. Does that even count as a neck at that point? What the fuck? This man's movements are stiffer than C fucking 3PO, my god. Apparently this dude traded in his wizard hat for the jumpsuit of Icarus from the Eternals. I'm uh I'm gonna be honest with you, this dude this dude's so weird that I don't really even know how to cover him. Created by Fletcher Hanks, the same creator as Phantoma, who's another character in this book we've discussed already, in Fantastic Comics number one of Fox Features of December of 1939. That would be the year after Superman debuted. Stardust initially seemed to be like another Superman ripoff and then immediately went off the fucking rails. He has no real origin other than the fact that he comes from outer space and has just a cavalcade of weird-ass superpowers. He's essentially omnipotent. I don't know why he's called a wizard, he's more like a demigod. To list some of his abilities, he apparently has artificial lungs that allow him to breathe safely under any condition. His skin is described as being made of star metal, whatever the fuck that is, and is apparently indestructible. He can emit spectral rays that make him invisible or as bright as the sun. He's completely immune to both heat and cold, and he is, quote, a master of space and planetary forces, which are essentially just saying he has the power to do whatever the fuck he wants, which is usually just help America out by doing crazy demigod shit. And by that, I mean he just fucking smites people. Not kills, 
smites. He condemns a gang of thieves to a planet of golden diamonds, apparently on the cusp of, and I quote, a black night that will last for centuries. He feeds a crook to a golden octopus monster. He inflates the head of a murderer to the point that his body withers away and then throws him through, I quote, the space pocket of living death where the headless headhunter, the hugest giant in the universe, resides, and that giant then takes that head, replaces his own, and absorbs the murderer. What the fuck is this character? Unless they wanted to do like an uber dark Miracle Man style revival for this character. I'm, I'm gonna say regrettable just because I'm confused. So I was talking with Scarlett yesterday, and we got on to the topic of comic book adaptations. Specifically because she said that she hadn't watched Superman Red Sun, and I personally think that the animated movie is a little bit better than the comic book. Cuts out a pretty good amount of the fluff, the weird-ass ending is cut out. It's my personal opinion, and I haven't watched it in a while, so don't take my word for it, but that's my initial thought. My neighbor's dogs apparently disagreed with me. But you see, that got me thinking. I started wondering, what are some other comic adaptations that subjectively are better than their comic book counterparts. And I don't mean adaptations in like the MCU adaptation way. No, I specifically mean stories that were a direct adaptation of a comic book story. For instance, I think the Under the Red Hood animated movie is far superior to the Under the Red Hood comic. Cuts out all of the fucking fluff, gets right down to the meat of the story, keeps the drama going, and honestly, there's very few parts from the comic that I would add back in. Off the top of my head, I would only really switch the Fatal Hand of Five back to the original two supervillains that Jason Todd was fighting in that scene. If you want to know who it is, just go read the comic. I can't say one of their names on TikTok anyway. Everybody's opinions are different, so I'm not going to say that any one version is better than the other. Everyone just has their preferences on which stories feel a little bit better. I'll leave your opinion in the comments. What are some comic book adaptations that you think are slightly better than their original stories. With the caveat that everybody's opinion is subjective, you can't say bad shit about someone else's opinion on which story is better. I'm just genuinely curious on what some people think. I think as comic book fans, it is about goddamn time that we have a very serious conversation about how fucking sadistic we are to our favorite characters. Like, if you're a dedicated comic fan, you have a favorite character, and with those favorite characters, you usually have favorite storylines that go with them. But have you ever taken a minute to really think about what happens in that storyline? My two favorite characters of all time are Red Hood and Deadpool. My two favorite storylines for them is Under the Red Hood and Deadpool, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Now, if you haven't read those comics, you're probably thinking, yeah, those are just two comic names. If you have read those comics, then you know nothing nice happens in either of those books. Deadpool, in continuity right now, has active beef with the writer of that series. Just because of how fucked up the storyline was to him. Not because it was bad, but just because it fucking hurt. I don't know, maybe it's just my sadistic, sad, comic-loving ass. But leave your favorite comic in the comments, and... Do a little bit of self-analyzation and try and figure out, is this, this story nice to the favorite character that is in this story? Because I'm willing to bet that it isn't. However, I'm not 100% sure because I might just be fucked up. And that is going to be it. I want to thank absolutely everybody for watching. I finally got a video out at the beginning of the month. I know, it's impressive. Uh, I just want to take a moment to thank all of my lovely, lovely patrons over on Patreon. Amanda Bardstead, Andrew Lanowitz, Anna Eliza B, Background Joshua, Bill Bro, Brandon Laney, Carol Cowett, Danny Walker, Dark Nimbus, Devaniculus, Diandra, Dee Dee, Dragon Fang, Fuck Me Ray Bradbury, Fireball Sensei, Gas Boss Gate Light Girl Keep, Jacob Safel, Jeffrey of Isles, Jenny Chanti, Kai Demon AXB, Cat Q, Katie Hawkins, Magu, Nixie Shimo, Pandora A, Pinchy Mugre, Raymond Villasana, Righteous Duke, Ricky Tiki Davi, Sandra Wallace, Tangled Web, The Holy Corroda, T.S. Famder, Ultraviolet, Wofu Badge 2, and all of my other lovely, lovely patrons. And if you too want your name read out at the end of every single YouTube video I put out here, then feel free to hop on over to Patreon and donate $15 or more. Or if you're just feeling generous, even as little as a dollar. Anything helps. This is only possible because of you guys. I know I have been saying this for months, but I promise there is a project that is right around the corner that I am actually getting a lot of work done on. And I am very excited to show you guys. I'm very excited to actually be able to put out more content here. So stick around, hop on over on the Patreon. I hope you guys are enjoying the content so far. 
I think that's going to be it for this month. So I will see you next time.